This is a timeline of college basketball points per possession for each season. In other words, how efficient the average offense was in the given year. If we scroll to the right, you'll see that 2024 and 2025 were the most efficient seasons in NCAA history. 24 set the all-time record at 1.05 points per possession. Then it was topped the next year with 1.06. But the interesting part is that the growth in offense had nothing to do with three-point percentage. There wasn't an increase there at all. 10 years ago, the average three-point percentage was 34.7. In 2025, it was just 33.8. So what's going on here? What's led to this offensive improvement? I'll answer that question, but first, let's go back to December 20th, 2018. The location is Madison Square Garden. Zion Williamson has taken the basketball world by storm in his first month and a half as a Duke Blue Devil. Tonight, he's playing against an undefeated Texas Tech team that a few months later would go all the way to the national championship game. Spoiler alert, after falling behind by eight early in the second half, Duke goes on a huge run to end the game and hands Texas Tech their first loss of the season. But despite that result, the Red Raiders defense put together an interesting blueprint for how to slow down Zion and Duke. The Blue Devils were called for nine offensive fouls, which was the most committed in a single single game tracked up to that point in the season, according to an article in The Athletic by Ken Pomeroy. Of those nine fouls, eight of them were due to Texas Tech successfully taking a charge. In fact, Zion fouled out of the game on a charge call. It was his third of the night. Like I mentioned, Duke ultimately survived, but it was the first time all season they had been held under one point per possession, scoring just 0.85. And by the end of the season, Texas Tech would finish with the best adjusted defensive efficiency rating in 20 years. They were an all-time great defense. The nine offensive fouls were no fluke. The charge was a major part of Chris Beard and Mark Adams' defensive strategy. By forcing the ball handler to the baseline and then aggressively helping outside of the restricted area to take a charge, Texas Tech's defensive scheme spread like wildfire to other coaches. Scott Drew, Grant McCaslin, Buzz Williams, TJ Osselberger, and my former boss Chris Jans are all prominent high major coaches that used no middle defenses after Tech's success. In other words, no middle was the most popular defense in all of college basketball. The key word there is was, because now years later, basically no one, including Chris Beard himself, is running the defense to that same extreme that the Red Raiders did in that 2018-19 season. The most popular schematic concept in the NCAA is now starting to go extinct. Why? Because of a major rule change that not enough people are talking about. I'll explain that rule, and more importantly, I'll explain exactly how it's changing the way defense is played. And don't forget about this timeline, we'll be adding more stats to it at the end of the video. My online course is now available for purchase. It was created by myself and Ken Pomeroy, and in it, we teach basketball analytics from the ground all the way up. The course was made specifically for coaches and teaches you how to use data to optimize how you think about basketball strategy. It contains 12 modules on all different facets of the game and can be taken at whatever pace you'd like. For a limited time, you can use the promo code YouTube for a discount at checkout. Link is in the description. There were numerous rule changes made prior to the 23-24 season. The rule that will undoubtedly get the most attention is the subject of this week's video. Legal guarding position. Last season, a defender needed to establish guarding position on an airborne player prior to that player leaving the floor. However, this year, Rule 417-4D says, when the opponent with the ball is airborne, the guard shall have established legal guarding position before the opponent places the last foot on the playing court prior to becoming airborne. So the rule used to be that you needed to be in legal guarding position prior to the offensive player leaving the floor. Now the rule is you need it prior to the offensive player planting his foot on the ground. There were plenty of people who were skeptical that this rule would change anything. Those skeptics have been very wrong. To start the 2024 season, players trying to take charges were getting called for blocking fouls at such a high rate, defenses were forced to stop trying to take charges altogether. Even the teams and coaches that used to love the charge the most. 
It's arguably now harder to take a charge as a secondary defender in college than the NBA. The NBA rule is you must be in legal guarding position before the offensive player is in his upward motion, which in terms of sequencing, upward motion happens after the plant foot has occurred. Blue 12 establishes guarding position outside the restricted area. However, he does not get both feet on the floor prior to white 23's last foot touching the ground. Last year, this play was correctly called a player control foul. This year, however, this play will be correctly called a blocking foul on Blue 12. I talked in the intro about how Chris Beard was the king of the charge. Not anymore. His team at Ole Miss now relies on using verticality when helping on drives, a technique where the defender puts their arms straight up in the air and jumps to contest the driver. By rule, you're entitled to a vertical contest even in the restricted area as long as you jump straight up and down. You can't jump from A to B, only A to A. That's the terminology officials use. With more coaches now teaching verticality, block percentage increased from 8.8% .8 in 2023 to 9.3% in 2024. Charges aren't specifically labeled in NCAA play-by-play -play data, but offensive fouls are, which includes charges, but also things like illegal screens or hooking fouls. According to CBBanalytics.com data, offensive fouls decreased by a ridiculous 37% in 2024, and then they decreased even more in 2025. Defensive technique and scheme has clearly changed, but it goes beyond just the vertical contests. Let's go back to 2019 and look at Texas Tech's foot angles here. Kyler Edwards is so aggressive in his no middle stance, he's basically parallel with the sideline. Or here, look at how they guard RJ Barrett. He's a lefty, yet he's being forced to drive left. The goal for this version of Beard's team was to send the ball baseline with a help defender stepping up to take a charge as soon as the driver got even a little out of control. In 2025, Beard's team is still no middle on defense at Ole Miss, but with a pretty different philosophy. When Michigan State drives baseline here, watch Juju Murray. He cuts Trey Holloman off, not letting him drive. You would have almost never seen that from Beard's past teams. They dared you to drive baseline, riding you right into the help defender to take a charge. Here's a similar situation with Sean Padula keeping the drive in front of him. Now there are remnants of no middle still there. Ole Miss still wants to close out to the top foot and help with the low man. That low man is just going to vertical contest now instead of taking the charge. Here you can see Dre Davis's feet are forcing the ball baseline, and Ole Miss certainly does attack the ball, forcing a jump ball. When the ball is below the wing towards the corner, you still see teams with extreme no middle foot angles. But now that you can't take a charge, almost everyone has decided it's not worth playing no middle when the ball is higher up in the slot area. For example, Michigan State had four middle drives from the slot in isolation situations against Ole Miss. That's because the Rebels now guard the ball square in the slot. CJ Moore wrote an excellent article in The Athletic about the charge rule. He has a quote in there from TJ Otzelberger explaining how they now play square in the slot at Iowa State as well because of the rule change. We used no middle concepts at Mississippi State last season, but also treated the slot differently than the wing or corner guarding it more square and trying to keep the ball in front. However, when the ball was below the slot, we took a different approach than most defenses. Traditionally, the player guarding the lowest defender on the weak side is the main helper in a no middle defense. There's a lot of different names for this defender, but we'll refer to it as the low man. Usually the low man positions himself on the midline in the center of the lane. On the drive to the basket, that player would come over and take a charge, at least before the rule change. But last season, we put our low man on the strong side lane line, all the way over closer to the ball. The theory was that because you can no longer take the charge, the help needs to be even closer to the ball to prevent a drive to the rim. Now that positioning is pretty extreme, but I have plenty of video evidence of us doing it. Here Josh Hubbard is the low man, here it's Keyshawn Murphy, and here it's Claudel Harris. On this play, you can really see our principles. Claudel's man cuts through to the weak side, but instead of going with him, he stops right on that lane line where he's then able to stop the ball. In a perfect world, we wanted to be aggressive with our low man, attacking the ball handler, trapping it along the baseline, and creating turnovers. 
dangerous. A teaching point was for the low man and the player guarding the driver to have four high hands, making it as hard as possible to pass out of the trap. If a driver wanted to try and take a contested jumper over our trap, we were going to be okay with that low percentage too. Those aren't what get you beat. Obviously the real risk here or anytime you double team the ball is you have to guard four offensive players with just three defenders on the weak side. Here we're in our trap, Sean Jones should be getting inside positioning to take away the basket, and the other two need to zone up and essentially play free safety. Hub should split the difference between these two, and Cam should split the difference between these two. One of the hardest parts to train was to get the players in this position to pivot and get into what we called split depth. Hub shouldn't be in the paint, he should have more depth so that he can close out on the skip pass and take away the three. Here Murph should be in split depth, but you can see how his instincts bring him into the paint instead. Another challenge was to get our low man to move on the flight of the ball during a long pass. The ball is about to be passed ahead to the wing, making Riley Kugel the low man. He's behind the play, so now our trap is also playing from behind. Bad things usually happened if our low man was late or out of position because the player guarding the ball would be expecting a trap that just didn't come. As you might expect, the skip past three gave us some trouble if our traps weren't on point. The three point line was our biggest statistical weakness on defense all season long, and not being able to take charges on players leaving their feet to make a skip pass across the court certainly isn't ideal for any no middle defense. Although I will say the first season with the new charge rule in 2024, Mississippi State's defense was still very good, finishing in the top 25 in defensive efficiency. That same year, Chris Beard had by far the worst defense of his D1 coaching career. Ole Miss ranked number 141 in defensive efficiency that season, and it's probably not a coincidence it came right after the new rule, given Beard's reliance on the charge. So those are the main schematic ways the rule has changed how defense is played. Vertical contests on shots around the basket, squared foot angles when guarding in the slot, and then for us at MSU, putting the low man on the lane line instead of the midline. The statistical changes from the rule have been pretty drastic, but I still haven't explained the question in the intro about this timeline. It turns out the offensive improvements were due to an increase in two-point shooting and a decrease in turnover percentage. Those are the exact categories affected by defenses taking charges. The charge makes it harder to finish at the rim and by definition leads to a turnover. Without it, those stats have improved for the offense. Now the question becomes what will defenses cook up next to fight back against this increase in efficiency? The game always evolves. Necessity is the mother of invention. I don't know what that evolution will look like, but I'll be watching.